Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Well, Whole Foods Market is going small. The Amazon-owned grocer is opening new small format stores aimed at serving quick trip urban consumers. You've heard this throughout the day from Charlie Pellet. It's called Whole Foods Market Daily Shop. The stores will range between 7,000 to 14,000 square feet. So to put that in perspective, a typical Whole Foods store averages about 40,000 square feet. So Pretty, like, pretty small compared to a typical store. The Daily Shop is also going to offer similar but slimmer assortment of products, ranging from fresh produce and frozen food to prepackaged meals and the 365 branded products, but they will not have buffet bars or meat counters. For more, we go to Christina Minardi, Executive Vice President of Growth and Development at Whole Foods Market and Amazon. She joins us here in the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers Studio. Christina, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me today. Well, thanks so much for, for joining us. So I... I I remember this is not the first time that Amazon has experimented with Whole Foods going smaller, um, or even Whole Foods has experimented with it. So back in 2016, Whole Foods opened smaller stores called 365 by by Whole Foods Market. Um, If consumers remember that, how is this different? Um, Well, thank you for bringing that one up. Uh, The 365 store was actually before Amazon acquired us. And uh, it was a time when we really needed to work on our value image um, prior to Amazon. And, uh, you know, we learned a lot from the 365. You know, we did close them and not close them, but we converted them over to Whole Foods Market. So you made them like the main Whole Foods. Yeah, into 2019. And uh, this one's a little different because the 365 stores were 25,000 square feet. Oh, so they're bigger. Yeah. Yeah, so this is smaller. The idea around Whole Foods Market Daily Shop is really for a convenient shop. If we learned one thing over the last few years, as you were saying earlier, you love home shopping, you love it being delivered to your house. People want things quickly. So we envision for daily shop is our customers will still shop our regular stores here in Manhattan, but they'll have another avenue to shop Whole Foods Market that's quick and easy. If you want to come in and you need to get something just for dinner tonight, or you're going to have a dinner party, uh, we'll have all of the items that you need. What's the difference, right? I, I'm one of those shoppers that I go into a Whole Foods or my local grocery stores to look at all the cheeses and find a new jam, and you know I do it for fun and it's my um, it's my therapy. <laughs> so bring me some bring me some cheese and jam, Chanel. Come over Come anytime, Tim. Uh, the fridge is stocked okay. always, sometimes too stocked. <laughs> Christina, what can't you find at these places if if you're one of those people that likes to explore? Yeah, everything you just mentioned, you'll be able to find in Daily Shop. The difference is, is how we're delivering it to the customer. So when you go into a typical Whole Foods, you know, we'll have a full service meat counter. This store will have the same selection of meat. It just won't be in the counter. It's how we're delivering it. It's packaged. We're still going to have all of our beautiful cheese and my refrigerator is the same. Lots of cheese. So we'll still have the same selection, but it'll be wrapped and ready to go. Again, quick in, quick out. That's the idea behind it. So Amazon has owned Whole Foods for a number of years at, at this point. And I think people in Manhattan will be familiar with the Amazon Go stores. Um, Is there any sort of relationship or like learnings that you took from what Amazon brought to Amazon Go in terms of technology, in terms of consumer habits that you then brought over to um, this version of Whole Foods? Well, the Amazon Go stores, uh, you know, we have them in different cities and they're significantly smaller. They're only about 2,500 square feet. But, you know, that's what I love so much about Whole Foods Market and Amazon. We all learn from each other. And you know, we lean on Amazon, obviously, for technology. Like the store is going to have Amazon uh, Palm, which is uh, yeah, you know, uh, Whole super Foods has easy. that. The big, yep. Some Whole Foods that I go to have All that. the Whole Foods yeah. have it now. Okay. And we will have it, obviously, in Daily Shop. So we really learn from each other. Um, and you know, just like we did a deep dive on the 365 concept as we were developing this concept, um, we've worked closely with the Amazon Go team. Um, so we are constantly learning, and we really lean on them for help But not technology. cashierless technology at this point. No, we'll not have JW. Uh, at least the first couple of stores. Um, we'll have self-checkout, we'll have a manned register, and then we'll also have the Palm. Do you envision it ever having sell, uh, ever having this technology? You know what, I, I ran into this technology at a ski mountain recently, and yeah. I think it was actually probably, it might have been actually Amazon technology. Yeah, you're finding um, more and more of it now. But 
Uh, do you envision like a, a, a 7,000 to 14,000 square foot store having this tech? It could be possible for the first few or not. We okay. really want to uh, concentrate on uh, how we're displaying the product. Uh, we have a little more freedom when you don't have JWO in a store of how abundant. And that's the thing about Daily Shop when we design the store. We use some new designers. Uh, and every place that you turn, you're going to see product. I mean, we really used every inch of the space to really just celebrate food. So you'll definitely find your cheeses. I just want to say, I don't know what JWO is, but I Sorry. imagine it's... Just walk out. Just walk out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so it's go. like, you know, you some places, it. some airports have it now. You know, yes. you walk in and you leave and they you, st you still get charged. So you're not so stealing yes. it. Let's take a step back for a second. Because what was the demand you felt that you were meeting here? Is there a reason, that was there a trend among shoppers that you saw that you said, hey, this would work? Yeah, I think you said what I said earlier is convenience. You know, I have a very good friend of mine uh, who's lived in the city most of her life. She lives 14 blocks away from the store right down the street, 57th Street store. She won't shop there because it's 14 blocks away. Mm -hmm. But she loves Whole Foods. So, yeah, she can get delivery. But if she wants to experience, like you said, have that experience while you're going to the store, we're going to pop these in between Whole Foods uh, stores and you'll be able to experience Whole Foods in a convenient but way. But is that is that uh, stores being busier? Is it New Yorkers being lazier? Right? What is driving them to want more convenience when you can already get your food delivered? Having delivery, I think, is great for a, a good segment of our customers. But like you said earlier, you love shopping our stores. I, what we find with our customers is they use delivery and they shop our stores. So this is just going to give them another avenue to shop our stores in a convenient way. Talk to us a little bit about um, this relationship that Amazon has had. Critics, I don't, critics have said that Amazon has not figured out retail yet. Um, which is pretty remarkable given, or physical retail, I should say, pretty remarkable given their footprint. And they haven't really figured out like the Whole Foods identity and, and how they work that in. You've been at Whole Foods for, well, since the 1990s at this yes. point. So you've seen many different iterations of it. Um, how, how, would you, how would you respond to that if, if, if critics said that? You know, um, it's been a wonderful partnership. It really has. Uh, again, to lean on um, the technology that Amazon has, the, the discipline in running your business, the processes, that's been really great. And I think now the competition, uh, the uh, like so people like myself, where we're overseeing, I'm overseeing Amazon teams and Whole Foods mm. market teams. So bringing those teams together, we've had just really good results. You have 40 years of retail on the Whole Foods side, and then you have all this experience of Amazon. Um, we're going to win in grocery. We're going to be a world-class grocer for each of the segments, whether it's a conventional shopper or a Whole Foods market shopper. Amazon, we're going to win in grocery. What do you think is kind of the the thing that New Yorkers will like most about this, and, and how do you see it expanding onto other cities? I mean, does this only work for really big mm, cities? That's a good question. You know, for right now, we're going to concentrate on cities. Uh, obviously, New York, we've been very successful here. Um, but we, we've done a lot of work the last few years in really trying to realize what's the right size store for the market, even if we're looking at a suburban store. You know, is it a 40,000? Is it a 25,000? So we've got a, we've got a great science team on the Amazon team that's helping us figure that out. Um, so we're making really good real estate decisions. Does the does it work if people have cars, or is this a, a store concept for people who aren't driving? No, I, I think it can definitely be both. Like I said, we're concentrating on the on the cities right now, um, but I envision again that we could have. Uh, stores like this, even in suburban areas, now, suburban dense areas. You would, yeah, suburban mm -hmm. dense areas. If you think yeah. about it, does it allow you to somehow open more stores because you you can open smaller ones? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, finding a real estate box that's uh, you know a seven or eight thousand square feet as opposed to fifty thousand square feet, we can move a lot quicker with our growth with these Nashville, stores. Nashville, upstate New York. What do we think, Tim? <laughs> hey. Well, if, as long as we can do Bloomberg Radio from there, you know, <laughs> then then I then I'm good. Hey, I really appreciate you uh, coming by, Christina. Thanks so much. That's Christina Minardi, Executive Vice President of Growth and Development at Whole Foods Market and Amazon, talking about the new Whole Foods Market Daily Shop, the smaller footprint stores uh, that are a fraction of the size of a typical Whole Foods. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Well, each week here at Bloomberg, the Markets Live team does an investor survey. It's the MLive Pulse, and it asks questions about different elements of financial markets. This week, 
it's all about private credit. And a majority of respondents in the latest Bloomberg Markets Live Poll survey said that private loans are a safer bet than the risky publicly traded bonds this if the U.S. economy stumbles, so if the U.S. does go into recession. That's not all, though. More than 40 percent said private credit is most likely to perform best in credit over the next 12 months, and that's despite a majority also predicting weaker returns and lower quality and direct loans as competition between lenders intensifies. Well, I want to focus on that competition between lenders intensifying, at least at the beginning of our conversation with Christina Paget. Uh, curious what she has to say about all of this. She's head of leverage finance research and analytics for Moody's Investor Service. Uh, she joins us once again from New York. Uh, Christina, good to have you back. How are you? I'm um, good. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining us on this. So I wanted to start the idea, uh, start on the idea of weaker returns and lower quality when it comes to direct loans, because back in the fall, late summer, fall, your team wrote about a so-called, quote, race to the bottom as a result of competition between banks and direct lenders, likely resulting in more defaults as riskier debt deals get done. Have we seen that at all play out, in your opinion, over the last few months? Well, I think the first part of the story has emerged. So mm -hmm. in 2023, we really saw most risky deals just go directly to the to the private credit uh, oh. entities, you know, and the, and the public sector deals really remained on the sidelines as investors really um, didn't show a lot a large degree of interest in the riskier part of the of the rating spectrum. So what we've seen in January and again in February were deals that had gone to the direct lenders coming back to the syndicated loan market as I think investor optimism improved, the belief that rates are probably going lower. So the the syndicated loan market is decidedly cheaper. And so that's the primary motivation. And so we did see deals come back to this market. And I think fundamentally behind that story will be a tightening in spreads for both markets as they compete. Um, but the other thing that we generally see when competition intensifies is terms get worse for the creditor. In other words, the, the loan agreements get much more flexible, much more favorable to the borrower. And the borrower in this case is, is primarily um, a private equity backed LBO. So, Christina, that might be good for the borrower, but not as good for the lender. And if you're the lender, how do you know that m many more private credit firms, many more banks are not chasing uh, risk at their own expense? How do I know? How do you know that they're not chasing it at their own expense? Yeah. How do you know that they're not diving into riskier and riskier deals to chase some return here? I mean, I think that that's what we will see right now as a consequence as we see riskier deals coming to market. I would still say that the most risky deals really still um, primarily go to the direct lenders. So that's where you have really the least visibility. Do you think that the market so, needs to be more transparent, right? I mean, this is a market that really it's not as publicly available to see when things are going south uh, in private deals. Do you, would you recommend that this market does become more transparent over time? I mean, I think that is generally speaking where the you get a better sense of what's going on in the market and you can prepare yourself for a variety of outcomes. And uh, this market is particularly opaque. A not small part of the market is comprised of the business development corps or the BDCs. They are less opaque than other parts of the market in that they do report the loans on their books, but they don't have the same obligations as a bank has, for example, where there is actually prudential oversight as well. The regulatory burden is much different. It is a much more lightly regulated part of the uh, overall financial market. And it, it doesn't allow for as much preparation for, you know, some more uh, consequential dynamics that could happen if the economy weakens, if the rate market changed materially. You know, at the moment, I think everybody feels pretty good about where leverage is going from the perspective of a lower rate environment. It's it tends to be supportive. And you know, 23 and 22 were, were pretty painful mm. for highly leveraged entities as rates just went up pretty dramatically over a relatively short period of time. Well, speaking of lending, I do want to jump in with a redhead crossing the Bloomberg terminal. Uh, banks uh, stuck with 
X Debt, this is the company formerly known as Twitter, held refinancing talks with Elon Musk. A bank group spearheaded by Morgan Stanley held discussions with Elon Musk and his team about refinancing a roughly $12.5 billion debt package that supported the tech billionaires take private of the social media platform X. This according to people with knowledge of the matter. Yeah, it's interesting, Tim. The parties discussed options that could reduce the cost of the debt to make it less risky for the banks to hold. The talks had faltered earlier this year. You know, Christina, it's interesting. We're it's talking, kind of a perfect segue. <laughs> it is a perfect segue. Uh, Christina, we're talking a lot about why these banks are able to really reopen the leveraged finance markets, and it's because they're not held with as much hung debt as they were, say, a year or so ago. Uh, are there lessons learned about the, the financings that were done in this era where people were kind of fast and loose? Are there kinds of companies that you think why either, either banks or private credit lenders will be wary of financing at this point in time? I think in general, you can say that, you know, if you looked at 2021, everybody was very optimistic, rates were low, the expectation was actually for the economy to be strong. So while there was a lot of risk taking that went on, and, and that's where a lot of the hung deals came from, you know, it was kind of hard to anticipate where rates were going with the, the you know, the war in Ukraine, uh, that the impact of supply constraints, there were a lot of uh, exogenous events that would have been fairly hard to anticipate. But I think that's why what you see among the banks are a certain kind of prudential regulation, right, to sort of limit the amount of exposure they might have to riskier credits. And I guess the converse is true among the private credit direct lenders, right? Mm -hmm. They have less constraints and they have different ways of addressing that risk. They have a different relationship with the borrower than you do in the, in the syndicated loan market where they're much, the relationships tend to be closer. They tend to be fewer lenders and negotiating is different and perhaps one could argue more efficient but um, I think there will always be periods of um, generous lending and then regret. Right. <laughs> you know, I don't think that's really going well, away. And I think that's why we look to certain kinds of constraints on that behavior. The BDCs do have limitations right. on leverage. Well, and so and that does prevent some um, ultimate uh, risk in terms of how much they're willing to take on in any particular case. Well, Christy, this is why we love checking out, uh, in uh, in with you every few months. Um, you give us an update on what you guys over at uh, Moody's and uh, Investor Services are, are looking at when it comes to private credit. That's Christina Paget, head of leverage finance research and analytics for Moody's Investor Service. This is Bloomberg Business Week. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Well, he grew Princeton's endowment nearly tenfold over his almost 30-year tenure, from $3.5 billion to $34 billion, generating an average annual return of 10.5%. Over the past few decades, past two decades, I should say, the recent years have been a bit challenging. It is an important fund, of course. Earnings provide roughly two-thirds of Princeton's operating revenue and 70% of the undergraduate financial aid budget. Princeton is the richest U.S. university when measured by endowment per student. Those are all tidbits from a recent profile of Andrew Golden, president of the Princeton University Investment Company. That profile, courtesy of Bloomberg News higher education finance reporter Janet Lauren. We're lucky to have with us both of them this afternoon, Janet and Andrew, here in the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers studio. Good to have you with us. Uh, Andrew, I want to start with you. How are you? I am groovy. Thank you very groovy. much. Groovy. You got a few more months until you, you know, officially uh, hang up your hat. Um, we got to ask you, though, before we get into your history at Princeton, Shanali reminding me that if we close in the green today, we're 16 records for the S&P 500 just so far this year. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk to us a little bit about how you see this market. Is it a, is it a market that's uh, has too much concentration in, in tech? Is it a is it a market where uh, things have moved too quickly, too fast? Are you seeing froth? What are your impressions? Well, I want to emphasize that whatever I see in the market at any one given uh, point in time really doesn't influence how we invest. Uh, so I'm not particularly good at making predictions in terms of just evaluations. Yes, valuations seem quite high, 
uh, in may be the case that for some companies uh, that's uh, justified, but it's not clear that that would be true across the board. So I sleep a little less well than normal. <laughs> How well? Okay, so a little less well than normal. I, I think it's fair to say that that's a... Uh, um, a market take from somebody, so I appreciate that. Um, Janet, I want to broaden out the conversation a little bit and just give us an idea of, of, of how all this got on your radar. As high edu education finance reporter, I mean, you cover the performance of endowments. It's a big deal that uh, somebody like Andrew, who's been there for you know close to three decades, is, is leaving. Yes, and I have to say, my colleague Joe Mysick pointed out um, this very funny um, mention in a bond offering document, which is a very staid document. Hmm. And uh, Joe emailed me and said, what is going on here? Because the the bond offering, um, which Andy can talk about in a little bit, uh, mentioned some of Andy's nicknames, that he goes by Sparky and the Commodore. And I said, this would be a great time to write about his retirement after almost 30 years. So I'd like to start with, what did the endowment look like when you came in 1995? Was it mostly stocks that were directly hold, held, bonds? And how did you go about to change this program that produced such spectacular returns? You, you know, uh, Princeton was in the early days of, of uh, diversifying the program. So it was not, it was mostly stocks and bonds, but uh, the uh, uh, chair of Prinko had articulated a few years prior three initiatives that uh, meant more private investing, more engagement in hedge funds, and uh, a, a less successful program that was uh, originally called Global Balance Management, uh, giving trusted advisors very large blocks of money and say, do what you will, invest all over the world. So it was uh, definitely uh, making progress uh, there. Uh, it was funny, the governance was different, that we had to bring every major decision to the chair, to, to Dick Fisher, who had this day job as being uh, CEO of Morgan Stanley. And so my early years uh, was to work on changing that governance so that we could have a, um, uh, a, a much more uh, uh, complicated roster uh, to, to uh, uh, invest with uh, the world's best investors pursuing niche strategies and to create that that uh, broadly diversified program. Andrew, what is the art of choosing fund managers here? You know, you look today and it's like every private equity firm, every private credit firm, and every hedge fund is holding their own investors to a different metric. So how do you kind of parse through the noise? Yeah, well, it's a great question, and it is uh, mostly art. Uh, I, I like to describe myself as a request recovering quant and that means that I understand just what the limitations are of just That's so nice rear I'm failed quant <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, still time these are not mutually it. exclusive I, I, there's a reason why I re you know, I'm in recovery um, the, that uh, assessment of who's going to be a great partner is really critical and it is art I uh, when I make my pitch to recruit uh, Princess Best and Brightest and others to come join us, I say, this is one of those 10,000 hour things that it's going to take you a long time to learn, but in some sense you already know. It's the equivalent of saying, who do I want in my study group? Who do I want to partner with? Uh, people have written books about this. I would say the underappreciated um, uh, uh, element of this is what I call seeking an alignment of appetites. That sounds like alignment of interest, but interest can be contracted. Appetites are those natural things. What is motivating someone what, to come to work every day, work hard, and try? Uh, is it to be the very best at what they do, or is it simply to make themselves as rich as possible? Andrew, remind us of, of what asset the asset allocation is right now, roughly. Roughly. Well, uh, our mission is to uh, produce uh, very high returns forever and to, to beat inflation, so it has to be quite aggressive. Uh, we have just 8% as our long-term target to our uh, fixed income uh, portfolio. Uh, you know, interestingly, we have uh, a relatively small uh, portion in traditional, uh, call it a dozen points, in uh, traditional uh, long-only accounts okay. uh, in developed markets. Uh, a similar sized amount in emerging markets. Um, we have a, a good bit in what we call independent return, which is a subset of what the world calls hedge funds. Uh, these are managers who uh, are given a little bit broader license to invest in ways that we think will produce high equity-like returns, but without so much dependence on market movements in most environments. So if you short out uh, 
uh, some stocks, then you're reducing your your, your equity beta. The, the 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 big gorilla, of course, is our private equity program, um, which is um, uh, in the high 30s percent uh, uh, range, and the, uh, a smaller amount in real assets. Across the board, we're just trying to invest where we think we have a competitive advantage. And can you talk about that venture capital portfolio? I think there was one year that it had like a 100% return, if I'm remembering correctly. And and where do you go from here in terms of find? What are you looking for in new managers? Well, uh, we're very excited, uh, particularly in venture capital, about finding new new managers uh, because uh, it's an industry that needs to refresh itself. Um, you know. As you well know, a big emphasis for us has been to really expand our networks as to how we find those managers, which is uh, motivated by and actually has resulted in a much uh, a greater uh, amount of diversity uh, in terms of the, the, the individuals who are, are, are running our, our program. And we're doing that simply because we think we can make more money if we're tapping uh, previously undertapped uh, 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 sources of talent. That gives us an advantage. Of course, in uh, trying to uh, deal with the issues of investing, bringing multiple t- ways of thinking uh, to the table uh, creates uh, a, a, a huge advantage. Uh, so uh, what we're looking for in venture capital generally uh, can be summarized as because venture capitalists have to um, convince the investments to in- to allow them to invest. We're looking for people that are not just smart, um, not just hardworking, but have that special uh, quality of folks are going to root for their their success. So uh, can you talk a little bit about the bonds since we are, you know, we're here because of the, the bond issuance. We found that fun little tidbit. What are these bonds funding? And you can talk a little bit about spending money at Princeton. Right. We, we have a very ambitious capital uh, 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 plan. Uh, we feel that we owe it to society to uh, do as much as we can within our area of expertise. And uh, that capital plan includes simply an expansion, doing more of what we've always done, bringing more students. But it also means keeping up in uh, areas uh, like engineering, which obviously there's uh, new things to, um, to research and to teach. Uh, in that area, and it seems that um, uh, critical for future leaders, which we hope we're trading, uh, to have some exposure to that. So at the same time as while we're uh, funding uh, uh, additional space in engineering, we also, I I, I think you said that you were on campus recently, we have this uh, amazingly ambitious and amazing uh, art museum uh, project. So the, the whole idea is to um, just really uh, allow for uh, folks to have a, a full uh, a, a range of understanding uh, human knowledge and wisdom uh, in a very diverse side way. Hey, speaking of uh, human knowledge and wisdom, you worked under the legendary David Swenson at Yale. Shanali, I don't know about you, but this was, we went to, Shanali and I went to different business schools, but I think this was the first case study that I did in business school was the Yale Endowment. Um, what did you learn from David Swenson, and how did you bring it to Princeton? You know, uh, David was uh, very uh, good at uh, teaching all of us uh, the importance of uh, first principle thinking, uh, and uh, that gave him um, the wherewithal uh, to plow ahead uh, even when it was against conventional wisdom. Hmm. Uh, so I, I, I think I learned... Um, Uh, a lot from just that idea of uh, do whatever you think is the right thing subject to the constraint that um, you won't get completely run over for attempting to do it. (laughs) Um, And I mentioned the word completely because, you know, David did not um, shy away from any challenge. Well, so on that note, too, we're talking about first principles. We're talking about the 10,000 hours, you know, so many rules of thumb. When you kind of look around the investment community these days, what are some things that you think have become flyaway behaviors? You know, are there things that, um, you know, you would advise have become normal ways of thinking in the markets these days that maybe shouldn't be? Well, again, going back to Dave, you know, he wrote the second book on 
basically don't try this at home, right? <laughs> even uh, if there's a case you know, study. And now everybody is trying this at <laughs> home. Even if there's right. a case study, don't try it at home. <laughs> right. And, and so I, I think you know, there's a whole slew of things that uh, people are doing because Yale and Princeton and MIT and others are doing it, but they don't have the staffs and they don't importantly have the governance structure. Uh, there's an old saying that good clients make for good architects, and it's true that good bosses make for good investment officers. Mm -hmm. So to be blessed with a, a, a board and an you know, entire governance chain that actually comprises sophisticated investors and understand that uh, uh, you know, mama's warning, mama said there'd be days like this when things don't exactly uh, work out the way you would hope, and to have that a sympathetic view and to get into the quality of analysis as opposed to saying, well, you know, we're just going to do um, uh, whatever, you know, has outperformed over the last several years. Um, a question to Janet's great reporting here also. We were talking about the reason for the bond. Why did a bond document need so many personal details about you? <laughs> Look, I, I, I think the answer is that the personal details are so compelling it, it, <laughs> the market demanded it. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I, I know that I know the bonds priced very very well and I'd <laughs> like to believe it was because of that extra details of that give it a sense of uh, <laughs> just how the sausage was getting made in terms of uh, the stewardship. Well it is great fodder for, yeah. for Janet. Right well and of course that endowment per performance does signal a strength to bond investors but you know looking back at 30 years what has made you the most proudest in terms of the investments and also you know how the money has been spent yeah I think it's actually how the money has been spent is the most important one to focus on uh, you know early on I think I've been here about three four years uh, and Princeton announced its first major step up in financial aid uh, which was not just about undergraduate aid but making uh, our graduate students life uh, 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 much better uh, my son was on the playground when uh, his best friend whose father was an important professor at, at uh, Princeton came up to him and, and, and uh, said, my dad says that your dad's a hero, right? So that, that, that was a cool. proud just ego, uh, ego moment. Um, you know, but I think our leadership on things like financial aid and in better access and importantly better support for the students who do uh, come here so you know that the graduation rates are, 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 are what they are. You know, on the investment front, it's a, it's a, a thousand little things and I would say as opposed to it being something that you could write in your story about, you know, how I yeah. remember looking out my window and thinking about the problem. It's, it's more knowing that I've connected with people on my team, knowing that I've connected with our partners. Hey, that's, uh, that is with us right now. Very pleased uh, to have Andrew Golden, president of Princeton University Investment Company and higher education finance reporter Janet Lauren. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Okay, Shanali, it's five foot nine inches. It walks like a bird. It's got glowing white eyes and it's got one job. Plucking empty yellow bins off a shelf and ferrying them several feet to a conveyor. And it does it over and over again. Again, and it has a really cute name. Digit. Don't worry, it's just in the testing phase. It's not going to transform the logistics industry anytime soon. But it is a major technological leap forward, and it positions its maker at the vanguard of an effort to build machines that can toil alongside human workers. Matt Day writes all about Digit in uh, and automation in the forthcoming issue of Bloomberg Business Week. You can read the story now on the Bloomberg Terminal and at Bloomberg.com slash Business Week. Matt joins us from our Seattle bureau. Matt, good to have you with us this afternoon. If we think about um, a, a, a product like Digit, this is a humanoid-ish robot that is set to do, well, what many people, and I think the numbers prove it, dangerous repetitive tasks um this is like the uh the holy grail when it comes to automation if they can figure this out oh it sure looks like it, it looks like we're on the cusp of something um predictions like this are kind of dangerous territory for humanoid robots you know they've been around for decades in some form but you know mostly as kind of stand and wave machines or other kind of experiments but it really looks like especially with agility turning on manufacturing later this year that they're actually going to step out into the world and do some some useful stuff for the first time okay so that's a point that you make in the piece that i think is is really important here i, I think it was 
Late last month, we covered the huge funding round uh, from Figure.ai that included investors uh, such as NVIDIA and others about humanoid robots. But you make the point in the piece that there are lots of startups working on this type of thing, but the company that makes Digit, Agility, these ones are actually among the first to be tested in a real environment, no? Yeah, that's right. Um, they were tested by Amazon, are being tested by Amazon starting last October. Uh, GXO Logistics, uh, the XPO um, warehousing spinoff, they tested over the holiday Rush having um, digit actually in a warehouse they used to ship Spanx, um, hmm. so just moving tote from conveyor to conveyor. Yeah, these guys look like, at least when it comes to the hardware, um, they're, they're pretty far ahead, at least cutting edge, but likely ahead of the rest of the pack out there. We're seeing images right now on our, our YouTube broadcast and on our Bloomberg Originals broadcast of, of actually what Digit looks like in the warehouse. Were you able to, to these are hard, tough, tough places to get into. Were you able to actually witness Digit doing work? I was, yeah. Just it was real, real early days. The first week they had these things on site at a warehouse outside of Seattle. But yeah, it's it's you know as advertised, they kind of boop along. Um, it's pretty, pretty strange and unnerving to see them actually working in person. I don't know. There's just something about the human, the human form factor, and then the the noise they make. There's this kind of like you know they're as their actuators are lifting things and they're squatting down like there's little ee -oo -ee -oo that they do. Um, <laughs> like, like, kind of a funny, funny little dance. Hey, Ewoks. Matt, <laughs> how do humans feel about these robots? I mean, at the end of the day, when you think about AI and what it does do that could help out workers and the way that it can kind of step into jobs that workers would have otherwise had. I mean, how do people feel about this? You know, I think there haven't been enough cases where uh, actual sort of line workers in, in work sites have been exposed to, uh, to folks like Digit, folks, robots like Digit, to have, um, to have strong reactions. One thing we did learn from Agility is, you know, they didn't tell us exactly who um, had this experience, but in one of the trials, you know, they, employees put a vest on Digit, a safety vest, uh, just, just the same kind that our workers used, and there was kind of a kind of a shocked reaction to it. So they decided to go another route and label it, you know, for safety in some other manner. Um, but just the the notion that like, oh, this is wearing the same the same vest as me. This is here to to take my job. That was kind of a different, hmm. certainly different optically than you know just a little green robot. That's really interesting to hear. Um, I'm looking at the Bloomberg terminal, Matt. Amazon has one million five hundred and twenty five thousand employees. The very high proportion of those are employees who work in the warehouse and do deliveries. This is as of um, December 31st. Does Amazon talk about, or based on your reporting about Amazon, talk about a world where the company has fewer employees because they're able to use robots such as these? You know, internally, they've targeted um, what they call fully automated or highly automated warehouses for years now. It's, it's been definitely a goal for them to at least explore, theoretically, could we do this with basically no people in the warehouse? And they've, they've backed off of that in recent years, you know, in part because technology just seemed always too pie in the sky and there were more practical things they could do right now. You know, now when it comes to, to sort of public relations um, and the stuff they say outside the house, they've said, listen, you know, we've been using robots in our facilities for a decade. In that time, we've hired hundreds of thousands of people. Like our intent with this stuff is not to, you know, just whack away at, at our workforce. We're trying to make, you know, things more productive, trying to get goods outside of our warehouses as quickly as possible. Um, they say that remains remains their goal, but certainly when you introduce humanoids into a, into a warehouse, it's going to raise some new questions. You know, Amazon has had a huge history of how it's operated with robotics in the past. How does this kind of fall into the big picture from how it's interacted with robotics for the last decade in automation? So, so most of the robots to date in Amazon facilities have been little wheeled robots that no one would confuse with a person, right? They're more in common with a scooter or a self-driving car than, than a humanoid. Um, those things today hold all of Amazon's inventory. They drag the shelves around to waiting human employees. You know, what, what we're looking at with humanoids in their warehouses and in, in other facilities, uh, if the technology proves out, is kind of being able to plop a robot down in a space that wasn't specially built for it, right? Um, you can think about robots working in the back office of a post office, robots mm -hmm. working in a, in a storeroom, right? Um, you know, not requiring kind of chain link fences and, you know, giant industrial facilities, you know, purpose built or purpose retrofitted for their presence, right? Presumably, we could just plop down these, these bipeds um, wherever we need them. Bipeds, two legs humanoid. It's all stuff like out of science fiction. You were referring earlier to the Kiva Systems purchase that Amazon made back in, in 2012, which for a long time was its biggest acquisition. It was $775 million at the time. A lot has happened, obviously, since then. Hey, Matt, I'm wondering um, if, 
if these things have to look like people, if, if these robots have to be humanoid in order to do the things that, that people do, Matt, do, do, they, do you think they have to, to look like human beings? Like, you know, the Kiva ones that you mentioned are on wheels. They, don't, they wouldn't be confused for a robot, but like, or for, for a person. Do, in order for, for these, these robots to actually be productive, do they actually need to look like human beings? I'm not sure they need to look like us, um, and there, but there's a debate in the industry about how much they need to look like us. They have to, they have, to have our similar shapes and dimensions to be able mm -hmm. to move around the same space. But if you look at the uh, startups that are plugging away at this, like Agility, you know, definitely from the, the pictures you've shown, it takes a, a kind of minimalist approach. Like it's clearly a robot. They're not trying to pass these things off as human. There's no you know, fake nose or mouth. If you look at some of, some of their rivals, um, so including some of the ones that are raising money right now, they have much different approach, right? You know, you, can, you see robotic arms covered in, um, in fabric material to make it sort of blend in a little bit better. Um, you see attempts at, at faces with you know, more human features. So there, there really is a range of opinion on whether they need to shoot for, you know, hey, this thing looks you know, plausibly human-ish, or you know, no, sorry, this is a, this is a work machine. And, and the work machine approach is the one that Agility has taken so far and the one that's uh, paying some dividends with Amazon. Matt, we only have 30 seconds left here, but like, what's the main innovation that's allowed these robots to exist and to be, um, to be developed right now? I'll, I'll cheat and I'll say uh, batteries um, oh. as well as AI, right? These things yeah. being able to pathfind on their own, that's key. Um, that's a really good point. Because you got to have these, these things have to have power and they probably use a lot of power, especially given all the complex calculations that they're doing. Hey, this is a really cool story. I truly cannot get enough of it. was really excited to, to chat with you um, all about what's going on at Agility Robotics uh, and how they're testing them out at Amazon. Matt Day, really appreciate you taking the time. Um, Matt Day is Bloomberg News Technology Reporter. Check out his most recent story or among his most recent stories. He's got quite a few. You can check it out on the Bloomberg Terminal. Also, read this one at Bloomberg.com slash Business Week. Once again, it's about agility robotics targeting the warehousing industry with two-legged bots, and he sees them eventually stocking shelves and working in hospitals. You're listening and watching Bloomberg Business Week. I'm driving in my car. I turn on the radio. Yeah, how about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me. I want to drive. It's the question that drives us. This is the drive to the close. That punk music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. Yeah, it is that time to drive to the close. We're just about 18 minutes to the close of trading on this Monday afternoon. Let's go to Sam Stovall, Chief Investment Strategist at CFRA. He joins us from Allentown, Pennsylvania. Sam, good to see you. How are you? Doing well. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, thanks for coming back with us. Hey, um, I'm going to ask you the question I've been asking people all afternoon as we uh, get ready to perhaps notch a 16th uh, all-time high in the S&P 500 if things continue on this path. Um, are you starting to see any froth out there, Sam? Well, I certainly feel the froth, uh, knowing that whenever we have recovered everything that we lost from the prior bear market, the market does tend to uh, stumble along uh, for another 5% or so before dropping from exhaustion. And we're at that point right now where I think that we could end up digesting some of the recent gains, uh, but I'm encouraged by the fact that we have never fall fallen back into a new bear market uh, after recovering what we lost in the prior one. Hmm. You think about just how few stocks have driven this market to 15 all-time highs. And you have to wonder- Just when this year. Just this year. And you wonder about putting new money to work and whether they should be in those concentrated names or whether you start to pick on either beaten down sectors or areas that have been less loved. How do you feel about it, Sam? Well, when I think back to the market's advance going back to uh, October 27th, when we had the recent low, S&P 500 is up 25%. But we've had 90% of the stocks in the S&P in positive territory and 45% of them beating the market. So it's not as narrow, I would say, as a lot of people would anticipate. Yes, a lot of the bigger gains have come from those behemoths. A uh, small number of behemoths, but there are an awful lot of companies. We're looking now at about 
two thirds of the 153 sub industries in the S&P 1500 that are above both their 10 week or 50 day, as well as their 200 day moving averages. So again, I would say that a rising tide certainly is lifting a majority of boats. Hey, Sam, one, um, you got an interesting note out uh, about what happens in the rest of the year after January and February uh, saw gains. Um, talk to us a little bit about the technicals here. Well, the S&P gained in both January and February, and normally February is actually a pretty weak month. It's actually the second worst month of the year, worst only to or second only to September. But in the 29 times since World War II that we had both of those uh, years, uh, both of those months in positive territory, we were higher for the entire year, 100% of the time on a total return basis. We were essentially flat in 2011. Uh, and But then if we think about, well, what about the remainder of the year? The S&P gained an average of about 12.5% with 93% frequency of advance, or in other words, only twice did the market fall in that 10-month period, uh, but 27 times it rose. So certainly not a guarantee, but an encouraging statistic. Sam, how do you think about the interest rate equation as it pertains to the stock market these days? Because you think about even just the week ahead, we have hours worth of testimony to Congress from Fed Chair Powell. We have a critical jobs report coming up. And should equity investors be a little concerned about the volatility we're still seeing in the bond market and the uncertainty around what the Fed does? Well, I think the market is coming to terms with the fact that the Fed will likely be slower to lower interest rates, meaning that they will probably have their first rate cut in June, which is interesting because historically, going back to the late 1980s, uh, it's taken about 11 months between the last rate hike and the first rate cut, which would be exactly on target this time as well. We also think that 25 basis point cuts will occur in the third quarter and fourth quarters. So a late start and then only three cuts this year, but more to follow in 2025. So if we end up seeing employment data that come in higher than anticipated, I think that could cause a bit of concern because that could give the Fed reason to start their rate cuts in the third quarter rather than the second quarter. Okay, so uh, if employment data comes in a little hotter than expected, that's a concern. What else out there concerns you? What what keeps you up at night, if anything? Um, well, I would say that uh, what keeps me up is why have small caps not really mm -hmm. done all that well, especially since they're trading at about a 32% discount to their average relative PE going back 20 years. Mid caps are at a 25% discount. The S&P 500 is trading at a 30% premium to its own PE uh, over the last 20 years. So I'm waiting for the mid and small caps to do well. And I think that is a function of how confident investors are, are likely to become as the Fed well, does start to cut interest rates. I think it's because the mag seven are not small caps or mid caps. I think that's the issue. I can answer the question, You're right? Absolutely right. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, but they started like, out, they did start out as, um, at, you know, a long time ago, they were, before they were oak trees, they were acorns. And, you know, I guess everyone's <laughs> just waiting for the, the other ones of those. Hey, you know, it's interesting, Sam, while he's talking about the acorns too, we've been talking so much about the MAG-7 and, and how well they've done. But if you think that inflation is still going to be hot, if you think that the economy is still running hot, you, you kind of painted this picture of employment being hotter than expected, maybe interest rates still high. What doesn't do well in that environment? Well, in a rising interest rate environment, it would, uh, or a hotter environment, it would be the groups that are doing well now, technology, financials, consumer discretionary, uh, because if the worry is that we are staying higher for longer and therefore heightening the risk of recession, which we do not see, uh, then that would certainly affect those higher PE stocks uh, at this point. Uh, semiconductors, which are up more than 70 5% since the October low. Uh, they were also up more than 100% in 2023. Uh, I think certainly they could be vulnerable uh, if it looks as if the Fed will certainly take longer. But we're still sticking with the fact that year on year, we're likely to see the uh, core PCE come in uh, 
at around 2.7, 2.6% for this year at 2% next year. So we're heading in the right direction. Maybe the speed is something that still is under debate. What about three rate cuts this year, just in the last 30 seconds that we have? Is that what you see happening? Yes. That's what I see happening. Three rate cuts this year, two more in the first half of 25. All right. Really appreciate you joining us, Sam. Always good to catch up with you. Sam Stovall is Chief Investment Strategist at CFRA, joining us from Allentown, Pennsylvania. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.